Greetings, church. How's everyone tonight? That's good. I missed church this morning. I've been, again, as crook as I've ever been in my life this week. <laughs> been sick for about a month and uh, thought I was getting over it. And then Thursday night got hit with it again and been pretty much laying in bed for the last three days. So it's been awesome. It's been an awesome weekend. And then I, f- and then I felt really encouraged by the fact that I wasn't the worst off in my family. My sister, who's pregnant, has been in hospital because she hasn't been able to keep any fluids down and food, so she's been on IV for the last two days. And my other sister was at a school fete yesterday and she picked up some disease from a kid. And so she's been throwing her guts up all, all night as well. So I feel quite lucky now <laughs> after hearing all those, all those bad stories. <laughs> all right. Um, it's good being up here. Um, don't get to do it very often, but when I do... Um, I feel like Big Kev, I'm excited. If you remember Big Kev from the old ads, it's been a while since you've seen him on TV. <laughs> but um, I get a good topic tonight of why serve. Last, um, I think it was last week, Matt preached on why worship, and we're going through these different um, why series of the church. And um, I really like this topic because I've been serving in different churches for um, pretty much my entire life. Um, started off oh, probably about 10 years ago at my previous church um, is where I sort of really flourished and got involved in church. And um, the pastor there, um, Ed Sims, very wise man. Um, and the way that he encouraged me was he let me do as many different things as possible in the church. And um, whether it was uh, you know kids club or youth group or music, and you know, over over time um, we sort of tried out everything and and found out where things that I was really interested in were, and that's how I came to be doing music and and things like that. So um, so I've pretty much been you know serving in churches uh, since I was about fifteen when I could sort of really get involved. Um, but uh, you know, I, I brought, got brought up in an independent Baptist family. Um, Mum and Dad were very influential in making us serve. You know, to start off with, it wasn't an option. <laughs> it was you serve, or uh, you're going to be in trouble when you get home. Uh, but you know, I'm thankful for that because it ingrained in us that um, you know, it, it's not really an option. Um, you know, if we, if we love God, if we love our church, then we should serve. Um, so why don't we have a word of prayer and then I'll get straight into the message dear Lord um, just thank you for this opportunity you've given me to share my thoughts on why we should serve in a church Lord Um, there's so many different things surrounding this topic and I'm probably only going to touch on a few basic ones tonight so I just pray that they would be um, insightful and helpful to those listening just pray that your word will be preached and the message will get across clearly. In your name, amen. Um, to start off, I want to share a little story. Um, at, at Great Hope Baptist Church, where I started ministry, um, the theme of authentic worship, uh, sorry, authentic community, was the core of that church. Um, and one of the things which really comes to mind is um, one of the old ladies called Dorothy Newton. And um, she was about 80 years old when I um, was at the church. And um, being an independent Baptist church, we had tracks and we would sit down and stamp all the tracks. And um, Dorothy Newton, she would do anything that she could physically do. She couldn't you know, go and hand out tracks, but she could sit there and stamp tracks and sit there and write letters to people, things like that. And she got to the point where um, she was just losing her mind a little bit due to her age and she was calling me by my dad's name she was calling my dad by my mum's name that was weird and um, it, yeah it was, just getting, it was just getting really interesting some of the things she would come up with but um, I remember sitting um, at the church one Saturday and we were stamping tracks and Dorothy Newton bless her heart stamping all these tracks and she missed every single one. She, she was hitting the table and other parts of the paper where the stamp shouldn't be. 
So we ended up having to throw out about you know, 500 tracks that she'd stamped in the wrong place because they couldn't read it. But no one in our church community had the heart to take away that ministry from her. And, you know, the cost of those tracks was nothing compared to letting her serve and giving her that sense of belonging and sense of that she's doing something for God. It didn't matter if she was doing a good job or not or that, you know, we had to replace the tracks and spend more money, but... Um, So a tract is like a little leaflet. So um, uh, all the time we would uh, have a little brochure of information for our church and we would walk around the community and letterbox um, with little brochures of you know, what times our services are and some of them would have the gospel message and things like that on it. So a tract is just like a brochure um, or something with a little gospel message on it that we would hand out. And you can hand out to the shops and, and storekeepers and things like that e- everyday life. Basically, so that's what a tract is. Um, so I just remember her sitting there, stamping these tracts, and all day she sat there for eight hours more than anyone else. And um, probably only about ten percent of the tracts that she did were actually usable, and the rest we had to replace and get done again. But um, but that is when you talk about authentic community. That is what comes to mind: is we're a family. You know, we pick up the people that a week and we um, we support them um, so the question is why do we serve and the answer is to contribute to the purpose of the church and everyone knows what the, the Great Commission is to make God known in our community and to go out and make disciples. Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So that is the purpose of our church. Our purpose isn't just to come here on Sunday and listen to a message, sing a few songs. But our purpose is to be trained up, to go out into the world and reach people, make disciples. And you know, in our church, each of us, is unique in the abilities and giftings that God has given us, which help us to achieve this purpose. And uh, as Javen read in 1 Corinthians, I'm reading from the New King James, New King James, by the way, as well, um, verses 4 to 6. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. now I want to pose a question to you. Yeah. From that passage, we all have different gifts, but can you just imagine if um, one moment that not everybody had different gifts? What if we all had the same gift? What if, for instance, everyone had the gift of hospitality? Now, we'd have a thousand cakes in the kitchen every Sunday morning. <laughs> we'd be fat. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm already fat, but yeah. <laughs> you know, what if um, everybody had, this, had the abilities of a door greeter? It'd be great. You'd come in, oh, welcome to church. Every, you get a welcome from 300 people as you walk in. But other than that, there's no musicians, there's no preacher. You know? It's all well and good to have be greeted 300 times, but if there's nothing else, then it's, it's, it's a moot point. What if we're all teachers or preachers? Yeah, he knows what I mean. (laughs) Yeah, we had 300 people in our church all wanting to voice their own opinions and their own um, ideas at the same time or preach every Sunday. Um, You know, different people have the abilities of finance or management. Um, But what if, for instance, everybody on the music team played guitar? Yeah. <laughs> Again, he knows what I mean because he's a musician. <laughs> but um, well, everyone played the drums. You know, you'd, I'd just end up with a headache after every every service if it was just drums. <laughs> but um, now that's why we have a diversity of gifts, so that not everybody plays the drums, not everybody greets people at the door, not everybody teaches. You know, people like Jabin and Pastor Matt and Steve are set apart as teachers and preachers. Um. 
people like myself and Pete and Josie and Manny are set apart on our different instruments for that purpose. Um, and that's how, you know, that's pretty much the function of a band, is different people with different abilities coming together for the same cause, which is to create beautiful music and to worship God. You know, we're not all cookie-cutter Christians. We don't all have the same abilities. We don't all have the same gifts. And why is that? And I cannot read that from here. <laughs> uh, verses 17 through to 19. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole body were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were one member, where would, be, where would the body be? Now you can't have a body if everyone's a foot. You can't have a body if everyone's a hand. You can't run if you only have one left foot. You can't hammer a nail in the wall if you have one arm. You know, everybody in the church with their different abilities makes up the whole body. You, know, you can't say that, um, you know, oh, I don't need my left eye. What if you lose your right eye as well? Then you're completely blind. You know, I saw a funny um, picture online the other day. It was um, a snapshot of a uh, TV program. And it was um, Stevie Wonder directs this certain comedian across the stage at some event. And if everyone knows who Stevie Wonder is, he's a blind musician. <laughs> so how, worse, how, how bad must this other guy be if he's got a blind guy leading him across the stage? So <laughs> and uh, it's funny. It's funny because I, I actually um, every time I preach, I've sent Matt Littlefield my notes, and he goes through it with me and makes little suggestions. <laughs> I was going to talk about AFL team, and he's got on here. Good idea. Good, good idea to talk about sports, but remember, this is Queensland, so you may have to tell people what aerial ping pong is. Smiley face. So at least he put the smiley face in there. But um, this, is, this is my AFL team, the Essendon Bombers. Um, and you can use any, any sport for this illustration, but um, you know, on, on any team, soccer, AFL, NRL, hockey, um, netball, anything like that, you have a group of players that are trained in the game, but every player has their set position. You've got forwards, you've got backline, you've got midfielders, you've got ruckmen, goalkeepers, things like that. Now, what if the coach one day decided, okay, Mr. Forward person, I'm going to take you out of that role. I'm going to put you in the back line. The key backman, I'm going to put you in the forward line. What's going to happen? To start with, your back lineman is going to kick less goals than your forward who's been training in that area. Your backman, who's actually now your forwardman, is going to stop the enemy from kicking more goals because he's not trained at defending. Now what you now we see the problem with that is that people people can still play in that position. It doesn't matter if you're a foreman playing in a back line, but they're not going to be as effective. Now what happens if the forward person just says, oh, I'm not going to play now? So not only have you got a defender in your forward line playing worse than a forward would, but now you've also got a forward in the back line who's not playing, so you're missing a, a defender. So <laughs> if people aren't suited to their role, they're not going to do that. They're not going to want to do that role. And I saw it in Essen Football Club. You know, we went through a few years where um, you know, our key players didn't want to play in the positions that the coach wanted them in for different reasons. And a bunch of them left. And now we've got new players in which don't know how to play with the team and we're in a hole that we sort of can't get out of because they're immature players that haven't played very many seasons in that position. But the point is that if the coach knows what he's doing, which thankfully our coach God does, he's going to put us in a position that we're suited to. And um, 
you know, it's very important as a team. But you know, even if um, you know someone gets sick, someone can fill in for that person. They might not be as effective in that role, but they can still fill in. Um, you know, I remember this song. Jabin might know it's a Southern Gospel song, and it um, the cor- the the chorus goes. Would your church be open this Sunday if you had the only key? Or would everybody be standing outside saying, where in the world would he be? Would it only be open on Easter or humming on New Year's Eve? Would your church be open this Sunday if you had the only key? And while the idea is we should be in church, that was the idea of the song, I have always thought of that song as if someone isn't at church to do their role, because, okay, let's say Jabin is stuck in traffic, and he can't lead the worship. I can lead worship. Does that mean that just because Jabin's not there that, oh, okay, Jabin's not here, I can sit down and someone else can sort it out? Yeah, oh, Pete's here, he can sort it out? No, it's, you know, I can take on that responsibility because, you know, I don't know what's happened to Jabin. He could, he could have been in an accident, he could have... Um, he could be at the hospital, so I can fill fill that role because James was not there. You know what happens if, uh, as that song said, if no one turned up to open the church doors, and we got three hundred people standing outside saying, "I don't have a key. I don't have a key." We're going to have a service outside on the car in the car park because all these different people that um, have got keys of suddenly not turned up. So that's the beauty of having an authentic community and um, serving in a church to a, with our different abilities is that um, you know, everything is not reliant on the one person. We need to serve and not swerve. Now, I've got a little joke to go with this one, which I think is funny. It's a blonde joke, so I'm just glad Olivia's not here because she'd go Row! at me. For that. <laughs> but um, there's a blonde lady driving down the down the motorway in her car, and um, there's a policeman behind her in, in his car, and um, for, for no reason at all, the, the 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 car in front of the policeman just starts swerving, it swerves and swerves and swerves. And then eventually it it swerves so fast that it goes off the side of the road and into the bushes. The policeman pulls over, gets out. Ma'am, are you all right? Oh, yes, officer, you won't believe what happened. Oh, I was driving down this road and um, out of nowhere a tree appeared. So I swerved and then another tree. And so I swerved again, another tree, and I swerved. And I ended up on the side of the road in the ditch. And the officer's just shaking his head and going, Ma'am, that's your air freshener. <laughs> yeah, I told you it's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. That's what it was good. <laughs> so, you know, and all jokes aside, you know, we need to serve and not swerve. Now, if you notice those two words, there's one letter which is different, and that's that W. You know, we need to be so careful that when we're in the church and we have opportunities to serve, we don't swerve and avoid serving. You know, that W, it might, it might represent for some of us that serving involves work. You know, we actually have to do something. It's not that hard, people. You know, we, we get up and go, we get up and go to, ch- go to work and get paid. Um, you know, but sometimes it's just the things in the church that need doing just takes that much effort to do, that much more effort to do. Sometimes you don't think you're worthy. You, know, you don't think you're good enough to do that role. You don't think you're good enough to do something in the church. Maybe you're worried about what other people think. You know, if I don't do a good job, people are going to get angry. Maybe you're weary. Maybe you've been serving in the church so long that you just don't feel like serving anymore. You know, Steve and um, 
Stephen Sewer on holidays. You know, they're taking a break so they don't get weary. You know, it's 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 a good thing to take a break. Um, you know, I've there's been that many times that I've been burnt out, and you pretty much force yourself to take a break because if you don't, you're going to kill someone at some stage. <laughs> well, maybe it's simply that you don't know what you can do or where you can serve in the church. You know, and that's again from personal experience. That's one of the biggest things which I've found with um, people which I've been trying to get to do stuff, especially at my previous church. I was in charge of the night service and trying to get people to do stuff, anything, read a Bible passage was just so hard. And you just have to constantly remind them that, hey, there's stuff you can do, you know, lawns need mowing, toilets need cleaning, you know, make a cup of coffee for the pastor after the service, you know, there's so much that can be done in a church. Um, and it's not all uh, fame and glory. You know, it's not all up on the stage. You know, there's only a handful of things which are actually noticeable things in the church. You know, preaching, music, um, things like that. You know, who knows here who cleans the toilets? Who knows who clean, who uh, mows the lawns or you know vacuums the carpet? <laughs> See people pointing. <laughs> but um, you know, a lot of a lot of things in the church aren't. Or fame and glory, and um, you know, you're not going to get up on a, you're not going to be put on a pedestal for um, a lot of things. But that's the beauty of serving in churches. It's not about, it's not about me. It's about you. It's about what can I do for the church. And lastly, are you a servant or a selfish? That's a picture of an ant doing push-ups with a log. So <laughs> you probably can't see it from there. <laughs> like a boss. <laughs> so are you, an, are you a serve ant? Or are you, or are you a selfish? And the reason that I've picked those two is um, the way that they these two animals work in the community environment. You know, ants, um, they form a community where everyone has the same goal and does their share of the work, whether that is looking for food, making new tunnels, or defending the nest. They protect each other and even teach each other. You know, there's some species of ants that, um, you know, when food is found, the more experienced ants, the older ants will... Um, lead the younger ants to where the food is and show them actually how to find the food. And um, as the ant is following the older ant, if the younger ant slows down, the older ant will slow down until it catches up. And when it catches up, it will speed up again. So ants, ants are a very communal um, creature. You know, and, and their whole purpose is what? Keep the nest going. Keep the queen fed. Keep the nest going. Whereas fish, you know, a school of fish, they pretty much got two purposes in a school of fish: is one, don't get eaten, and two, eat. That's pretty much a school of fish. You know, um, if a predator comes along, what happens with a school of fish? It, they, they just scatter, you know, and hope that they're not the last fish that's going to get mauled. <laughs> And then if you chuck a bit of bait fish out, it's not, oh, okay, you're hungry, you can go first. It's no, I'm getting that food before you do. <laughs> They're selfish. They're selfish. They're out for number one, and that's, that's their goal in life, is to be number one. Um, I remember I was uh, fishing down, I think it was either Tweed Heads or Burley Heads, I can't remember now. And um, there was a rocky point which me and Dad were fishing at, and... Um, we were there for probably at least two or three hours. And we could see a school of Taylor swimming around this rocky point just all day, just swimming back and forth, back and forth. And we were sitting there going, this sucks, we haven't caught a single fish. We can, we're like dropping the bait right on top of their heads and they're not going for it. And then this old fella comes up and he just 
he sits there for about 15 minutes, and me and Dad are getting more agitated, and he just starts laughing at <laughs> in his little, little old voice. He starts laughing at <laughs> you're never going to catch one of them. And we're like, oh, why is that? He said, if they're not hungry, they won't eat. And you know, I started talking to him, and apparently Taylor, when, when, when they don't eat, they don't eat. As soon as one fish starts eating, they all think it's time to eat. So you can throw a whole bag of bait fish out there, and they won't touch any of it until they're ready. But as soon as that first fish eats, whether the others are hungry or not, they'll just consume everything in sight. So, you know, we need to avoid um, being selfish and you know, going with the flow just because it's the thing to do and look at being servants and looking out for the hive and looking out for each other. Um, and uh, our la- my last point, um, again, another story, is um, one of my good friends, um, Noel Kelly. He's a Vietnam vet. And um, you know, he, he's preached a couple of times um, that I can remember. And one of the stories he always tells is pretty much basically the authentic community scenario. But um, he always challenges me every time he preaches. When he was in Vietnam, he was in a war zone with guys he didn't know. He got you know, platooned with you know, a couple hundred people that he didn't know from Bar Soap, and he got shipped off, and he had to survive with these guys. They helped him survive, he helped them survive. When he got back to Australia, he said it's the best thing in the world, being part of the RSL, um, Return Service League, League, and he said that from his squad, doesn't matter when or where, if he needs help, he knows that his squad mates will do anything in their power to get to his side. doesn't matter where they are in Australia. doesn't matter what they have to do. He knows that you know, if, if his wife dies and he needs a friend's shoulder to cry on, that they're going to be there. And vice versa. If they need him, he's on a plane straight away looking at what he can do to help them. And you know, I go to the RSL with him and have meals and just the amount of people that he knows, the amount of other veterans that he knows and has befriended and it, it's a community. It really is a community. And he always challenges me with the fact of if a secular community like the, the Veterans League can have a community like that, why can't the church? You know, if, if someone needs something in our church, What's stopping us from jumping at that opportunity to help them out and serve them? You know, um, there's so much that we can do in our church community. And for someone looking at the church from the outside, if our community isn't working, if our community is in shambles, why would they want to be a part of it? Now, for someone that's lost out in the streets, they're looking for somewhere where they can belong the people in our own church can't belong here anyway, what would attract them? So that's my challenge tonight is what sort of community are we making being lead? Are we making a community of, of fish that are all out for ourselves, that will you know, take the first bite of everything and run away and leave others to um, deal with the predators? Or are we going to be ants that create that community, create that nest, and help the nest thrive? Let's pray. Dear Lord, just thank you for um, what you've helped me share tonight. Lord, just pray that um, this church will grasp the concept of authentic community, Lord. And one of the ways that we can have that authentic community is to just authentically serve each other, take away our own desires and wants, and 
sacrifice others' needs before ourselves. Lord, just pray that um, some of these things that um, you've laid on my heart will um, sound true and that um, they would be remembered, Lord, and the illustrations um, would have would have the meaning that they intended. Just thank you for everything you've done for us, Lord. In your name, amen.